But we, we're in trouble economically. And the problem is it's like the boiling the frog slowly kind of trouble. That it's not a crisis. And this is what I really worry about. I worry about the fact that we uh, will we'll probably have 20 years of virtually no growth. People talk about we need to invest in the NHS. It drives me crazy when they're actually talking about day-to-day -day spending. Yeah. Now, there may be a need for day-to-day -day spending, but that is not investment. This is a big problem. But do you know what's interesting about that? Chronic underinvestment has been a characteristic of basically every nationalised industry ever. The bottom line is, it's a big tax cut, it's welcome, but there's bad news in the background, and the overall effect is not going to be as significant as one might think. Hello and welcome to the IA podcast. My name is Harrison Griffiths and I'm filling in for Matthew Lesh this week. And what a week it was. The Chancellor unveiled his budget, which included a 2p cut to national insurance and unfortunately a new tax on e-cigarette liquid. And so joining me to talk about the budget, what went well, what went wrong and what the Chancellor didn't do at all is the IA's Still fairly new, Executive Director Tom Clockerty. Thank Hi, you Harris. very much for talking about it with me today. Hey, it's my pleasure. So what do you make of the big ticket item, the 2P cut in national insurance? Yeah. Well, I mean, your intro made the budget sound quite exciting. Actually, by the time the budget was unveiled, it was all pretty boring because everything pretty much had been in the newspapers already. So we already knew that we were getting this 2P cut in national insurance. Comes on top of a 2P cut in national insurance from the autumn statement last year as well. Now, taken in isolation, 4p off the main rate of national insurance is a significant tax cut. And I think it's a welcome one. You know, we all know about the cost of living. We know about the rising tax burden overall. Uh, so people people will be pleased and should be pleased. Um, it, you know, it puts significant pounds back in people's pockets. That is no bad thing. But as is a common theme at recent budgets, there are really two things going on at once. There are the things that are announced on the day and which draw the headlines. And there's the stuff in the background that was announced long ago and is still having an effect. So in this case, chiefly the long-term freeze of tax thresholds while we've had high inflation. So if you really want to know whether taxes have been cut or not, you can't just look at the measures in the budget. You have to take these two things together and work out what effect they're having. And the annoying thing is they have different effects at different times. So right now, in the new tax year... Um, if you compare two scenarios, one is the situation that we are in right now, and the other is a situation where since March 2021, the tax system has just been on autopilot. There's been no changes to the rates or anything, but thresholds have just risen with inflation. Compare those two, two scenarios, and we are currently better off. It's pretty much a tax cut for everyone compared with the counterfactual right now. But the right now is crucial there because the freeze in income tax thresholds and national insurance thresholds is meant to carry on to 28, 29. So where we're slightly in the positive at the moment, tax cutting, we're going to be slightly in the negative, tax raising, by the end of that period, if the next government sticks to the freeze in tax thresholds. Lots of things could change. Uh, but I think the bottom line is, it's a big tax cut, it's welcome, but there's bad news in the background, and the overall effect is not going to be as significant as one might think. And it's... It seems to be targeted at kind of the the middle uh, quartile of the of the income spectrum so if you're earning yeah. uh i think the threshold 12,570 to 26,000 mm -hmm. i think you're net worse off because of fiscal drag than you were in April 2021 is that right right and then if it's 60,000 plus you're worse off as well but if you're in that middle which an awful lot of people in the country are then you are better off i mean do you think that that's intentional or do you think that you know in an ideal world that then the chance can kind of go back and make some different decisions on behalf of his predecessors mm. Mm. that he would have gone down the same route on this budget cutting national insurance if the income tax thresholds had been on autopilot since 2021 right I mean, we've been on kind of a wild ride when it comes to national insurance, right? Because um, Rishi Sunak initially raised it from 12% to 13.25. That didn't last very long. It was immediately, pretty much immediately taken back down to 12. But in between those two things, the national insurance threshold had leapt up pretty significantly. 
And that was a big tax cut in its own right as well. And that's kind of what makes the numbers look favourable when you compare those two scenarios I was just talking about. Um, and then we've had a 2P cut and then another 2P cut. And of course, the thing I really like about the budget announcement was the Chancellor's ambition to phase out national insurance for employees and the self-employed altogether, simplify the tax system, just have one tax on earnings, we'll call it income tax. Great. Now, I'm not sure we're actually likely to get there, but I like the ambition. Very good. Now, there are good reasons for targeting a tax cut the way you just described. So, yes... This is kind of targeted at workers, and it's targeted at, at you know people in the middle of the income spectrum, primarily. Now, there are good economic reasons for that, I think. These are people who have probably been struggling the most with the cost of living. You want to improve incentives for people to work and work more. Um, so both of those things are right. There are obviously political reasons as well why in an election year you might want to target your sort of core voters. There's lots of people in that bracket, of course. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not too bothered about that. What I do think is interesting, though, is the way that we keep focusing on cutting the basic rate, and that's fine. But we're not touching the higher rates or those thresholds. And so more and more people are being dragged into higher rates of tax over time. And effectively, the the, the basic rate uh, boundaries have really been squeezed because you've had that increase in the personal allowance historically since 2010. Obviously, that's been on hold for a while. The higher rate threshold has barely budged at all. Um, so you're getting this sort of shrinking bit of the tax system where you're cutting taxes, but then you're not you're not looking at the other bits. It's a pretty big jump now to go from effectively paying 28% as a basic rate taxpayer to suddenly your margin rate, marginal rate goes to 42% once you go over £50,270. Our tax system has become markedly more progressive. Some people think that's a good thing. And certainly if you're, if you're focused on redistribution, fine. But progressive tax systems do have a dark side because they, they make it less appealing to increase your, increase your income to take on new and more challenging jobs that pay more, and so on. And I do wonder whether we're getting too progressive with the way we tax earnings. You know, those are not really the considerations that went into the budget. There's good economics there. There's some good politics there. But I think this is the long-term picture that we shouldn't lose sight of. Yeah, so on progressive um, tax systems, mm. um, one of the criticisms, in addition, is that uh, a flatter or yeah, more neutral tax system, they tend to be broader based mm. and can raise revenue more efficiently than an overly top heavy progressive system. They are, however, often politically unpopular. Mm. And this 2P cuts national insurance has had to be paid for. And it seems to have been paid for with little additional taxes on lots of different interest groups in society. Just firstly, what do you make of that approach? Because mm. that sort of strikes me as a, a, a violation of the taxation 101 principle that you want to keep bases broad and consistent mm -hmm. um, and two one of those taxes is the vape tax um, we don't have the details of it yet but it's been reported that um, you know it could go up to sort of three pounds per milliliter above the equivalent threshold for a cigarette or something like mm -hmm. that we'll wait and see but yeah, yeah, so what do you make of the economics of that? And also, what do you make of the vape tax? Mm. I do think it's interesting following all the speculation that comes out in the run-up to these budgets, because and I don't know what was actually going on inside the Treasury, of course, but what it sounds like is they're getting updates from the Office for Budget Responsibility about where the fiscal headroom number is five years out. And all sorts of things go into that number, right? It depends on growth, um, it depends on inflation, depends on interest rates. There really is no way to accurately predict exactly where that fiscal headroom is going to be in five years. Now, I'm not against fiscal rules in general, but when they are basically, it, when the whole exercise of fiscal policy making is basically about gaming the fiscal rules, how much can you get out of it? And when it's varying and changing right up until deadline day to submit the budget, it seems to me this is not a great way to be making tax policy. We should have a clearer strategy. And that strategy, for me, it should be all about how do we make the tax system more supportive of economic growth? How can we encourage dynamism through the tax system? And we should have a long-term vision that we're moving towards. We don't have that. The whole method of tax policy making in the UK is kind of broken. Yeah. It used to be good as an act of political theatre, 
it's not really even that anymore when they leak it all before budget day. So I'm not quite sure what we're doing, right? But yeah, to get to your question more specifically, it sounds like they're racing around at the last minute to try and find little taxes that won't upset too many people to try and make the sums add up, to try and stay within the fiscal headroom five years out. And what they've done, yes, a vape tax will be introduced subject to consultation. Uh, the en the energy profits levy will be extended. And, and what was the other one? Oh, the non-DOM levy, the non-DOM tax. Yet. So basically abolishing non-DOM status and shifting to a residency-based system. Now, that one actually is a useful simplification of the tax system. Arguably, it may be stricter, less generous than is optimal. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Do people who had previously have been non-DOMs, are they going to start leaving the UK sooner? Remains to be seen. But I think the structure of that reform to the non-DOM tax system is sensible. The details may be a little bit off. The energy profits levy, really not sure about that at all. I think it was a bad idea in the first place. You can make a limited economic case sometimes for a windfall tax as a genuine one-off. But not the way they're doing it. Not the way they're doing it. And I think we, we do need North Sea oil and gas. Um, we, ne we need to be getting energy sources out of there. We need the tax revenue out of there. And what we're doing, I think, is hobbling the industry. Yeah. Big problem. Easy target. That's why they're doing it. And then the vape tax. The vape tax one I find particularly strange. You already pay VAT on vapes, of course. The case for going further than a general consumption tax and having some sort of specific levy on a product, I think has to depend on that product having significant externalities that you were trying to internalize. And I'm just not sure that case exists for vapes because, frankly, this is the best way anyone has come up, of, up with to get people to quit cigarettes and to switch to a much less dangerous product. There's no joined up thinking here because some parts of the government really want to encourage people to vape. Talk about vape, vape prescriptions. Vape, on at the moment. Exactly, right? Um, so I think, frankly, it, it, it's been in the news a lot um, and maybe there are some regulatory issues or there, there are laws that haven't been effectively enforced um, about selling to underage people, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Enforce the laws we have, sure. But I think maybe because of that controversy that's been going on, it's an easy target to stick a tax on, raise a little bit of extra money, make the sums add up. My big point, though, this is not the way that we should be making tax policy. And and I, th I think there are, you know, to go a bit more meta, there are a, a few meta points to be made on the vape tax and the and the North Sea um, profits levy, mm. uh, the, the windfall tax. Um, on the, the vape tax, you already identified it. It really is a, a small minority of people who have, as our colleague Christopher Snowden said in response to the announcement of the vape tax, who have done exactly what the government wanted and quit smoking, who are now being punished for it. But the, the, the other one is that the, the windfall tax was supposed to be a temporary measure, mm. set at a lower rate than it is now. The rate has ratcheted up. The additional taxes and regulations have ratcheted up since the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And now the time scale has ratcheted up. Um, I believe it was Milton Friedman who said, there is nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. Is that what we're seeing here? Well, potentially, yes. And of course, petroleum revenue is already taxed at a higher level than standard corporation tax anyway. So, so yes. I don't know if it's going to become permanent. You can easily see this thing sticking around for a good while. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't want to keep that cash cow in the in the in the debt estimations, right? Particularly if a Labour government comes in and wants to increase spending. What's the easiest way to make this look good on the exactly. on the OBR spread? Exactly, and, and this is why I think we have to be really careful about these kind of industry specific taxes in general. Uh, you, you talked about broad base, low rates. Keep the tax system simple. Keep it neutral, crucially. You do not want the tax system to be incentivizing people to invest or not invest in certain areas or spend here or don't spend there. I mean, okay, there may sometimes be specific reasons why you might want to discourage people from buying cigarettes, for example. But no, you've got to kill, or, or a carbon tax would be a good yes. example of that. Yeah, a carbon tax isn't neutral by design because you're trying to reduce carbon emissions. That's the whole point of it. So if you have a clear rationale and you keep those to very limited specific cases 
where there's a strong argument for it, fine. But overall, you want to keep the tax system as simple as possible, as neutral as possible. Otherwise, you get into these quite dangerous political dynamics, I think, where you just pick on particular groups, particular industries, because they're soft targets. They're soft targets until they pack up and stop operating exactly. and then the revenue's gone. Which some already are, I, I believe. I think it was Shell have already cancelled an expected expansion of their presence in the right. UK and um, and I think EDF as well, as you know, and, and it's not a provider have done so. It's, um, yeah, we're, we're already seeing the very predictable impacts, I think. Uh, yeah, I want to turn to what I think is the more of the meat mm. of this budget, which is what the Chancellor didn't do. Um, this was our, our, our other colleague Julian Jessup wrote in City AM um, today that uh, this was a boring budget. Mm. There wasn't really an awful lot in it, but there is an awful lot wrong with the economy at the moment. Mm. What did the Chancellor not do that he probably should have done, mm. or at least started the process of doing? Sure, sure. Well, the last bit is important because I think we do tend to build up budgets too much, and you're not going to fix all of the economic problems we have with a budget. There's nothing wrong with a budget being boring. In a sense, it should be boring. You're talking about tax and spend. These are not necessarily deeply exciting issues, except to weirdos like me. So boring is fine, but the lack of ambition in certain areas, I think, is a problem. Now, the the big thing for me, the biggest thing coming out of this budget is just looking at the economic forecasts. And this is almost always the case. It has been the case recently anyway. That's the story. And it's not that we put enormous faith in the forecasts. Often often they're off here and yeah. there, right? But when you look at the kind of trends that are being assumed for our future, we're basically looking at 0.5% per capita GDP growth off into the future. That will basically be our standard growth rate from the financial crisis to the end of the 2020s. You're effectively talking about two lost decades in terms of growth. You know, living standards will be lower at the end of this parliament than they were at the beginning. Granted, we had a big pandemic in the middle. That had an impact, right? Um, but we, we're we in trouble economically. And the problem is it's like the boiling the frog slowly kind of trouble. That it's not a crisis, so it doesn't provoke an immediate political response or a policy response. It just slowly becomes the accepted thing. And this is what I really worry about. I worry about the fact that we will we'll probably have 20 years of virtually no growth. Bear in mind, we were growing at 2.5% per capita before the financial crisis. So our growth rate now on a per head basis is about a fifth of what it was pre-financial crisis. This is huge. Over decades, that makes an enormous impact on our quality of life in this country. And I think it's just being accepted as... This is the way it is. What can we do? Yeah, and the the, the bad news kind of keeps piling on. I, I saw literally just before we started speaking that um, graduates in their 20s, which is me <laughs> and people like me, um, are worse off in real terms than they were before the 2008 Great mm. Financial Crisis. Mm. Um, and that's not the only subset of people that are. But how do we arrest this decline, mm. this slow whimper? with which I guess our, our prosperity is mm. fading. I don't know why I'm smiling. It's well <laughs> it's, Well, see so you're all right. You, yeah. you you had a you if had you, don't, you, you had, had a, half your cry. Yeah, exactly. And and you had a couple of decades before the two thousand and eight crash to kind of enjoy um this is it for me. This is my life. Sure. <laughs> this is post two thousand and eight. But it's uh it, you know, what are the core issues mm. that we need to tackle? And Anybody who's watching this probably already knows what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say, but it's worth saying again because they still won't listen. So what do we need to do? What are these underlying issues that are causing you know, one of the largest, most important countries in the world to stagnate? Yeah. Part of why I think it's unfair to put this all on the Chancellor and on a budget <laughs> Is because it's not You're tax. the Chancellor for a lot. In this no, no, no. Oh, well, that, that's not my intention. But yeah, budgets are about tax measures, about spending measures. And you could boost growth by reforming certain taxes. And we talked in the run-up to the budget a lot about getting rid of stamp duty or at least cutting it away as much as you possibly can. Talked about some technical reforms to corporation tax, to business rates. Not very sexy, but these are the kind of things that 
would have a genuine growth impact, and they'd improve things at the margin. And we should do those things, and I'm sorry we didn't do them. But I think, I think there are bigger issues than tax and spend when it comes to economic growth. The planning system. Just shout the planning system over and over again. This is by far the biggest problem that we face in Britain. I think it's a problem that is on the scale or even more significant than the kind of labour unrest that we faced in the sort of 70s. Yeah. And just as hard to deal with, if not harder. So there's the planning system, and the planning system is housing primarily, but it's not just housing. It's building factories, it's building laboratories, uh, it's building bridges and roads and tunnels and power stations and electricity cables. It is so difficult to build anything in Britain. And when you can, it takes forever, and you're constantly subject to uh, reviews and consultations, and you forgive people for thinking, oh, I just give up, let's go and do this somewhere else, right? Um, huge problem, massive. Uh, you're preventing economic activity happening in the first place. That's bad. You're preventing a lot of things that would raise productivity in the longer run. That's bad too. One of the crucial aspects of that is you are preventing the agglomeration effects you would get from, say, London being able to massively expand upwards and outwards. Um, if, if, if we let London loose, we could have an enormous economic boom in my view, but we just can't do it for whatever reason. Energy is an important point as well. We do have extremely high energy costs in this country, and this long predates Putin, Ukraine, and everything. Um, you look at our industrial energy prices, we've been well ahead, maybe perhaps I should say behind the European competition, let alone looking at America or China. And and just it's just worth mentioning there that um, as as uh, some of our recent research has shown, the, uh, the the price of of the consumer price of energy has been climbing mm. since the year two thousand. It was really ramped up since twenty ten, and of course, it did spike massively after the yeah. the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but this has been a long running saga. But it comes after the nineteen nineties when the privatisation and liberalisation uh, of the energy market that was started under Margaret Thatcher mm. um, was actually seeing consumer energy prices decline by about 26% in real terms. So this is not a given, is it? It's not a given. It's largely a policy choice. Yeah. It's large, oh, It's a set of policy choices. And some of it is well-intentioned environmental policy. And we can argue about different ways of achieving the objective. But I think we have to break out of this mindset that energy is scarce and energy must be scarce and we just have to cut our cloth accordingly. We will not return to growth as long as we maintain that mindset, barring some sort of incredible sci-fi technological breakthroughs. Which, to be fair, in in uh, I think it's up in Sheffield, mm. they are they they have made big breakthroughs on um, on the nuclear fusion reactors. Yes, right? so yes, maybe that's the silver so, bullet. So we can't knows? we can't bank on that, though, can we? But nuclear is an interesting one, right? But my point here is, we have to have cheap, abundant energy. And by all means, let's make it clean energy as well and meet the environmental objectives. And nuclear would probably do that in a big way. Um, but if we just say, no, we're not going to build new power stations. No, it's too hard to string up new power lines across the countryside. We're just going to have to use less energy and less energy. We are not. That is not a recipe for growth. And that is storing up big trouble for ourselves down the line. Absolutely. And the... I think the other kind of big elephant in the room here is that even if you got to the stage where some of these big reforms like the planning system, like, you know, on, on energy were achieved mm -hmm. and we were seeing kind of transformational growth as a consequence of that. The big question that I'm interested to know is if even if we got to that point, how would the tax system still be holding back? UK growth because we mentioned another one of our colleagues again Christian Nemitz he's been making the case for a while now that free marketers should care a lot more about supply side liberalisation than tax cuts mm. I think that's right Yeah, but we, st we still do have the highest tax burden in about 70 years mm. and it's still still just slowly rising the last few budgets have yeah. marginally decreased the trajectory yeah. but it's still rising 
is that still an important drag on growth that we shouldn't lose sight of? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, I think it's always important to say that at any given level of revenue, you can have a more or less pro-growth tax system. So you could say, well, we're at 40% of GDP and we're stuck there and we just optimise for that. And without losing revenue, you could make the, the tax system much more supportive of growth. Uh, I mean, in simple terms, I think uh, you need to make VAT a much simpler, more comprehensive tax, just one rate on all consumption. That would raise potentially a huge amount of revenue, which you could then put back into getting rid of taxes like stamp duty, um, like uh, having full expensing for everything within the corporation tax system, having lower marginal rates on work, crucially, throughout the income distribution, not just focusing on the sort of the people in the middle. Um, so there are lots of things we can do. There are all kinds of ways that our tax system is not neutral, that it discriminates against investment, um, that it is biased against saving. These are really bad for long-run growth. And so we could fix those things. And we could do it at 40% of GDP. It would be a heck of a lot easier if we could get spending down and we could cut taxes as well as reforming them. Because tax reform will always generate losers as well as winners. And we know that the losers from reform are a lot noisier yes. and a lot more passionate than the people who win, who often don't really even notice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Concentrated so benefits dispersed. There costs. is a public choice problem there. Absolutely. But that brings us to the size of the state. Mm. And what this budget makes clear is that we have gone basically from being a 35% of GDP state to being a 40% of GDP state. And it doesn't look like that number is going to come down. If anything, if you factor in the impact of an aging population over the next 50 years, you're probably looking at going up towards 50 or north of that, unless you can fundamentally reform public services and the welfare state. And that is a message that I don't think has got through yet, that people just aren't really willing to confront. I think what we've had since 2010 is a valiant effort at times to keep spending under control. Mm. And of course, it's been a mixed bag because you've had... And, and, and what, what the budget yesterday, yeah, yesterday this week is forecasting is basically very modest real growth in public spending going forward about one percent but certain areas are protected and will continue to grow more strongly in real terms like health and spending on schools spending on defense so that means everything else gets squeezed to a degree a greater degree now that's fine i think that the public sector should be squeezed we should be able to gradually reduce public spending over time the problem is, if you try to do that without fundamentally reforming the services, they will just get worse. Yes. And I do think that's what we've, what we've experienced. And when you're confronted with a big fiscal imbalance, as we were after the financial crisis, it makes sense to start with the things that you can do quickly. So you just sort of take a, take a slice out of every departmental budget. You hold down benefits. You hold down public sector salaries. In a pinch, that might help. But it's not a long-term sustainable approach. If you want a smaller state, you have to start privatizing functions, putting things back on individuals rather than on the collective. You have to make them more efficient. You have to make them more market-oriented. And the big problem is we haven't really done that. There was some enthusiasm for public service reform in the coalition years, pretty much dried up since. We've been scared. I say we. I've not been scared. No. <laughs> but as yes. a country, politically, yes, we are. Yeah. there has been fear of touching things. And in fact, we've been expanding the welfare state. Yes. Right? Um Childcare subsidies, massive expansion of the welfare state. The which, triple lock on are, pensions, which, which hugely way, expensive. Ch childcare, uh, in absolute terms, up one hundred and ninety three percent consumer cost. Right, so right, that's not fixed the problem, has it? Yeah. Well, we 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 have been far from rolling back the frontiers of the state. We've been expanding the welfare state, and this is crazy when you look at the long term projections and what 
the impact of an aging population is going to be like. Effectively, over the next 50 years, we'll have to pretty much double income tax. Like, that's not how you would raise the money. But if you imagine we just had another income tax yeah. raising the same amount of money, everyone's tax bill doubled. That's kind of what we're looking at yeah. if we don't reform the welfare state. So we have to stop expanding it. We have to start rolling it back. But we need genuine reform. And we have to actually say, look, these are responsibilities which are going to go ha have to go back onto individuals and not be state responsibilities if we want lower taxes. And uh, there are a couple of important things in there on the spending side. That, that was kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about because you need to just the, the appetite for spending restraint is zero and we're getting to the point where it's absolutely necessary mm. like it's it's a serious problem and we are going into a, a very dark place when it comes to some of those long-term liabilities that you talk about like pensions and healthcare in particular um but do you think austerity coalition austerity was a mistake because i certainly do and i have a lot of sympathy with ideologically misguided friends on the left who say that it was a mistake mm. now i don't think it was a mistake for the same reasons as they do i think absolutely we needed to cut spending we need to cut a lot more spending than we actually did in the end mm. but you have a decrease in the size of the state without a subsequent decrease in fact as you say an increase in its scope mm. and all you've done is take it you've skimmed a little bit off the top you've done insane things like forcing local governments to take control of social care one of the right. biggest of the country's long-term li fiscal liabilities mm. while cutting their budgets mm. and you just made public services worse yeah and so how can we as free marketers put forward a case that yeah we need government spending we need a lot of government spending but not like that without doing the real austerity has never been tried type argument because it's a very different approach the 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 tom clockety as prime minister approach would be very different than the david cameron as prime minister approach wouldn't it sure. but can you outline how and the final question is related but slightly different mm. is what do you say to the people who argue that one of the main reasons that living standards in real terms are below what they were before the 2008 financial crisis that that is down to austerity. Mm. Yeah, so a couple of big questions there. Are. Okay, I'll, I'll let you go for it. So I think I'm 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 happier with austerity than you are. I think I think it was the right thing to do if you just look at the macro level, trying to reduce spending, and ideally, yes, as you say, would have gone further. I don't think that it had a massive negative economic impact at all. I, I don't think the extra spending would have been going to productive wealth creating activities. Um, so leaving more in the private sector is good from that perspective. Very good. But as I've said, austerity can only take you so far unless it is accompanied by reform, unless you are taking things, as you say, out of the scope of state activity, putting them back into the market. And that's just something we haven't been prepared to tangle with yet. But we are going to have to. I think this is the big thing. There's no getting away from the way our population is aging, at least not in the short term, and the kind of burden that that is going to put on the post-war welfare state. And to give you an example of where I think we've gone wrong, the triple lock on pensions. Yes. Now, there was a good way out of part of this burgeoning pensions uh, spending crisis that we're going to have over the coming decades. And it was the introduction of auto-enrolment. So many more people, most people, in fact, are saving for a pension privately. And you could have just let the state pension sort of flatline. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of reducing the, the state part and you're increasing the private part over time. That was a sensible approach. I'm not sure if it was intentional, but that would have been that would have been a good way of going about it to do it gradually. The way we've messed things up, though, with the triple log, means that the eventual adjustment will have to be that much harder yeah. and that much more radical. And we, I think, we do have to talk about things like people paying more directly for healthcare. Yeah, no getting away from that, in my view. Yeah, it's it, no no one does it like we do. 
Right. This is what I find remarkable, that these claims that, that it's the envy of the world. Why isn't anyone else doing it? No, none of our European friends who have much better healthcare outcomes than we do mm. have this Soviet-style top-down planned health system. Right. But it is nonetheless the national religion. Mm. And so my worry, and I wonder if you echo my concern, is that you will have you will have to see the NHS get to catastrophe before it's reformed. Mm. Because you talked about the 1970s when yeah, there was a serious prospect of default mm. on IMF loans but, and you had bins piling up in the streets and everyone was feeling the pain. Yeah. Everyone understood that something needed to change. Mm. But now there are a class of people, particularly if you bought a house in the southeast of England at any time in the last 40 years, who aren't feeling that pain. And despite bad comparative health outcomes, which are worsening, mm. there is still not a huge public appetite to touch the NHS with anything but more money. Mm. So how do you think that this much better and very necessary path comes about short of just really bad things happening? Mm. Because I mean, nobody wants to see the health system of this country implode. But it seems to me that that's kind of inevitable because short of that, it will it would eventually happen. Yeah. It's an unsustainable system and short of that, there's not going to be the political will to change before it gets really bad. Mm. Am I wrong? You're certainly very gloomy. Harris. I am a little bit. I, um, I hope that it would not come to that. Uh, but I think we need to win the argument. You know, and we've been having the argument, of course, but I'm not sure we've made a great deal of progress on it. But to a certain extent, this is understandable. People are used to the way healthcare is delivered. As you say, they assume that we're a sort of paragon of mm. healthcare brilliance in the UK um, and that other countries, if only they were lucky enough to do it the way that we do. I don't think people understand or fully appreciate that healthcare can be delivered in a whole host of different ways and that other ways of doing it might be better. Uh, there's an angle, here, and I think we can make that case and make that case better um, and eventually win people around. I do think that attitudes have started to change a little bit towards healthcare, actually, belatedly. But I do think people are starting to think, you know what, this isn't the envy of the world. There are serious problems, and it's not just all related to uh, nasty government not funding it enough. But there is a funding issue in healthcare, and it goes back to your austerity point, I think, and it's quite an interesting one. Probably the one way that austerity was a real economic negative is that, and this is inevitable, every chancellor, every government does it. If they want to save money, they slash the capital budgets yes. and they protect the day-to-day -day spending. Understand the political incentives there, but you're really stealing from the future yes. in that way, in that sense. Um, and, health and a great argument against things like industrial strategy and borrowing to invest as government policy, right? The, the, sure. the incentives are stacked for politicians to not do that well. Well, right. It, exactly. And so healthcare, there has been... When people talk about we need to invest in the NHS, it drives me crazy when they're actually talking about day-to-day -day spending. Yeah. Now, there may be a need for day-to-day -day spending, but that is not investment. Yes. And the NHS does lack um, capital, Right. It needs to have more machines and scanners and technologies and everything like spare that. Spare beds, even. And spare, even spare beds, even stuff like that. Um, and, you know, hospitals that aren't crumbling. Yes. This is a big problem. But do you know what's interesting about that? Chronic underinvestment has been a characteristic of basically every nationalised industry ever. When governments are in charge of things... They always prioritise day-to-day spending. They always develop a maintenance backlog. They always underinvest in the future. This is just the way it works. And that, for me, is an extremely strong argument for getting this stuff out of government control as far as possible. Absolutely. And there is, a, there is I suppose, looking on the less gloomy side, I'll be a bit cheery on this occasion, there is, I think, a growing dissatisfaction with the service that's being provided by the NHS. And mm. I get the sense, quite anecdotally, that a lot of people are very angry with politicians about it. Mm. I suppose the big step is to show people that 
it's not just these people. Like, these people are not uniquely evil or incompetent. Mm. But it's if you want decisions made politically, you will get the outcomes of decisions being made politically. Yes. And that means lots of zero-sum decisions when it comes to things like budgets. Mm. And that means a massive incentive to just throw money in the short term to placate negative headlines mm. rather than that long-term investment that actually kind of improves things. Though, again, I'm not, I'm perhaps you're a little bit more optimistic than me that that argument can be made, but yeah. I'm not sure. Um, Tom, thank you very much cool. for discussing that with me. Very interesting stuff. It was a boring budget, but I think, you know, we were, when we went a bit meta, I think we... We got a little bit more out of it than <laughs> yes, David, Jeremy Hopefully not a boring podcast. Hopefully not a boring podcast. Yes. We, we made Leave your thoughts in the comments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it wasn't a boring podcast, and I really hope it wasn't, and you did enjoy it, please do give it a like and uh, do subscribe to the IA's YouTube channel. Um, and do let us know what you think in the comments. Was this a boring short-termist budget, or do you think that there was a, a, a nugget of, of, of hope and opportunity for the economy to come. Let us know what you think. Thank you very much for watching.